Hello, today uh, our lecture is about the KLT transform. The unitary transform where uh, the important part of it is that uh, we can go back. So we can apply an inverse of uh, the transform. So by definition, we can call a transform using a matrix A as unitary if and only if the inverse of uh, A is equal to the Hermitian matrix uh, of the Hermitian uh, of A. And um, as uh, a reminder, a matrix uh, U, uh, we call it a unitary if its inverse is the complex conjugate of its transpose. And we call that Y times Y transpose conjugate will give us the identity matrix I. So um, if the elements uh, in this matrix U um, are a real number, then we use the orthogonal um, to describe this matrix instead of a unitary. And uh, for short, uh, we write U conjugate transpose as UH for the Hermitian transpose. And here is an example uh, in this uh, page where we have A and then the inverse of A is equal to the Hermitian uh, or transpose of A, which makes this uh, three by three A matrix a unitary matrix. So if you look at the 1D transformation, and in this case, we are having an X with dimensionality of capital N and Y with dimensionality of capital N. And then A will transform X into Y and A is an N by N, capital N by capital N matrix. In the case when A is real, so the elements in this matrix A are all real, and then uh, A and A conjugates are the same. And in this case, A times the transpose of A will give us the identity matrix. And in this case, we call the transform as orthogonal, right? So one of the important features of the unitary transform is that it conserves energy. Um, so if you take uh, one calculation of the energy in this sequence y, and uh, this is the uh, sum of the squares uh, of, of the elements in y, we can write it as the product of uh, the Hermitian transpose of y times y. That basically will give you the sum of the square of the elements in y. We can replace uh, y with uh, is definition in terms of x, which is a times x, Hermitian, and then replace uh, y again with a times x. And then if we apply the Hermitian transpose to a times x, that will give us x Hermitian or transpose Hermitian, and then times a, the Hermitian transpose of a. And then we have ax from these terms as they are. And if you notice in here, uh, what we have, the a uh, transpose H times A, which is this one here. This is nothing but the identity matrix. Uh, then we end up with uh, the Hermitian transpose of X times X, which is the energy in the original signal X. So uh, this unitary transform uh, matrix A, which is an orthogonal uh, matrix uh, in this uh, orthogonal transform in this case, conserve the energy when we move from the X to, to the Y. So just as a refresher, um, the expected value, we write it as capital E brackets of X of a random variable X. We define it as uh, the sum uh, over all uh, I between one and K of the product between um, the outcomes, which are xi's, um, and the probability of each of these outcomes, which is pi. Uh, 
So that's uh, just a reflection for those who would like to understand and remember what this um, expected value operator is. So now, um, one very high level concept of what a unitary transform does, um, it really uh, changes or uh, transform the coordinate system. So the basis function it try really kind of to have some kind of an operation uh, to project and rotate and shield the data. And uh, another way to look at it, and we mentioned this a few times before now, and we'll talk more about this once we talk to compression, um, it redistributes the energy among coefficients. So if you take a, a, a 90 by 90 image, um, then you have uh, this many, uh, every single element or pixel in this image uh, has an energy that contributes to the overall energy in the image. Uh, if you have a certain transform uh, that you would like to apply for compression, for example, then you are hoping that the energy will be distributed by this transform to concentrate into a fewer number of coefficients than 90 times 90. So uh, let us start by, um, and to understand um, the KLT and where it came from, let's start by uh, defining uh, the autocorrelation matrix. And in this case, we um, expect that the mean uh, of X and Y are both zeros. So in a, in a way, uh, this is our covariance matrix. So the correlation matrix for the output Y is equal by definition, the expected value of Y times the Hermitian transpose of Y. And as we did before, uh, we replace Y with AX. And then the Hermitian, uh, so we have AX Hermitian, it will give us the X, the Hermitian transpose of X times the Hermitian transpose of A. And the operator A and um, the Hermitian transpose of A, these are the transform uh, matrices or matrix. So they are uh, deterministic. Um, and X is really the random variable. So uh, the E operator in here, uh, it will operate on X and X Hermitian. We can take the matrix A out and um, the Hermitian transpose of A out as well. So the autocorrelation matrix for Y on the left-hand side is equal to A times the autocorrelation matrix of X, the input, times the Hermitian, um, the Hermitian transpose of A. And uh, keep in mind that the autocorrelation matrix, either for X or Y, uh, they are of the dimension, they are square of N times N in this case. So some facts. Uh, uh, or, or, or common knowledge uh, that we have collected so far over the uh, uh, past seven, eight weeks is that we can represent an image uh, in many different ways uh, based on different basis functions. And then uh, we can make an assumption that different batches, different blocks, two by two, four by four, eight by eight of the image or every column in the image as different realization of a random variable. Um, so that's, we can set it up uh, that way. Um, we can achieve computational saving if the transpose uh, transform is separable. And um, we can achieve fewer number of computation if the basis functions are orthogonal. Um, and the first question we have is, what would be the optimal basis? So um, it, in, in, in the an energy from an energy compaction point uh, view, if you can approximate the images or a class of images uh, that belong to some class, for example, if you can represent them uh, in a subspace that is created by the span of the first n functions in that basis, and uh, that number is much less than uh, the possible number of intensity or, or pixels in our images, then we are really achieving some form of uh, energy compaction that we could use that um, for coding or compression, for example. KLT uh, is an optimal energy compression algorithm, as we will see um, in the next um, few minutes. So 
KLT uh, by definition is a unitary transform and the transformation matrix, so the transform matrix uh, uh, A is uh, the Hermitian transpose of a matrix phi. Where phi is uh, the eigen matrix of the covariance matrix. And the columns in here uh, in this matrix are arranged according uh, to decreasing eigenvalues. So imagine that every column uh, in this um, eigen matrix represent an eigen vector. Then uh, we can uh, organize, uh, reorder uh, these columns uh, in a decreasing eigenvalue. So for every eigen vector, look at the corresponding eigen value, and then we arrange these in a decreasing order based on the eigen values. So. In this case, uh, if we choose the first few coefficient, then uh, we are performing a mean squared approximation, and we'll see uh, in a few minutes. And uh, that means this is uh, an optimal compaction transform uh, in the mean square sense. And uh, this way, if we do apply to get the inverse transform, is nothing but the superposition of the basis columns that are in this matrix in here. So if you are familiar with the principal component analysis or PCA, uh, this is very similar um, uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to PCA. Let's get started. So let's assume now uh, X, um, our input is a vector. Um, and let's assume that the dimension of this uh, the length of this vector is M, capital M. And now we would like to represent this vector X as the superposition of orthonormal basis vectors. We call them VI. So I have VM, so I have M of these vectors VI. So I have the first vector V1, the second one V2, V3, and so on. I have VM, I have M of such vectors, and every one of these vectors is of length capital M. So I can, these are orthonormal um, basis vectors, and now I can write X as the product of the matrix V, where this matrix V, every, the first column of the matrix uh, V is our vector V1, the second column is our uh, vector v2 all the way to the last column which is v sub n and i can write x our uh, vector x as the product between this m by m matrix v times alpha and alpha is um, a length uh, of uh, the vector of length m as well right? so i can write x as alpha one times the first vector plus alpha two times the second basis vector plus alpha three all the way until I get to alpha m times v m as a vector. So I can put this alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, alpha four together, and that will give me this vector in here alpha. And with simple operations, I can write alpha in terms of V transpose times X or every, el every element in alpha, which is alpha one, alpha two, can be written as X transpose times uh, a vector uh, VI. And so alpha, alpha one equal X transpose V one and so on. And the condition here that these are orthonormal basis vectors, which means VI transpose times uh, vj is equal to one uh, if i and j are equal and will be zero otherwise. So this is really uh, um, our constraint 
that will carry through uh, all our discussion uh, today. So now, imagine that I uh, approximate X by only using K number of basis vectors. I don't wanna use all the VM. I wanna use, I wanna stop at VK where capital K in here is less than capital M. So now that will generate to me an approximation of X that I will call X tilde, right? So now if we define the error between this approximation X tilde and X as the difference between X and X tilde, and I would like next to define this, the, the sum of the square of, of this error. So that will be the square of the L2 norm, which is equal to X minus X tilde as the error. And then I replace, remember X is I'm using all the M column in our matrix V, but uh, X tilde, we are using only the first K, right? And that's basically where I have this subscript for V and alpha in here, just to represent that we are only looking at the first K and the rest are equal to as zero. So this will be equal to the sum of the square of the element of what we have in here. And because for the first K uh, components, they are identical, so they will cancel out because of the subtraction here. And then what we'll be left with, I will be left with um, all the indices when I have I starting from K plus one to M, that basically the values in here were zero, right? So I'm not really using any of these VK and alpha K. And then I have uh, alpha I square. Right? So I have the sum of the square of what I have in there. And remember the constraints that we have uh, orthonormal basis vectors uh, V I. So now I established uh, an equation uh, for um, the square, uh, the mean square of the error, which is the sum over I starting from capital K plus one all the way to capital M of alpha I squares. So now the optimal basis is really the one that minimize this error. So in this square, and that's something we mentioned uh, in our definition early on, right? So the mean squared approximation. So, so now, if X is a random variable with zero mean, then we are really minimizing the expected value of this error. So we can really operate on the error with this expected value operator. And that will be equal to the expected value of this expression. I can write it as the sum over I between K plus one and capital M, to the expected value of the alpha I square. And from previous definition in here, I, I could write alpha I as the X transpose times VI. And that's what I have in here. So now I have an expression that give me the expected value of the error in terms of the K, right? Um, and the basis uh, vectors VI um, for an X transpose. So our objective now becomes to minimize this error. And as uh, our, our uh, objective function, our constraint is that uh, the VI transpose times VJ will be equal to one if uh, I equal to J, that these are orthonormal uh, basis vectors. So let's say you write, start to write the The L, uh, the, the square, uh, the, the energy in our X or the L2 norm square in our X. Um, so remember from our definition here, 
we could write x as alpha 1 times the vector v1 plus alpha 2 times the vector v2 and so on. So we can write that as in here. This basically we have alpha 1 times v1 plus alpha 2 times v2 and v1 and v2 are the basis vectors. And uh, these will we can simplify because of this constraint, right? So this one with this one here will give me simplification here. That will be equal to the sum of the square of the elements that we have in here. But we already know that alpha i uh, is, uh, is x transpose times vi. So if we plug in all of this in here, we get this um, simplified expression, which is the sum over all i between 1 and capital M of the x transpose vi all square. If I can split this into uh, two terms, where one term is the summation over i between one and k, and the second term is the summation over i between k plus one and m. So now I expressed uh, this expression uh, in terms of this my variable, which is the choice of how many basis function, a subset of the basis function, I'm interested in, which is capital K in this case. So now I could use that to say the sum over I between K plus one and M of the expected value of X transpose VI square, which is this term in here, right? Uh, is equal to the expected value of into norm square of x minus this term in here. Right. So now minimizing that error, so our this is our objective. So now notice this one and this one here. To minimize this error, right? That means minimizing this expression will require us to maximize this expression here. So I transformed my problem from minimizing this expression here to maximizing this expression in here. And remember, we write this alpha i square, but it's really in here, but this is nothing but the x transpose vi in our objective function for this minimization. So now the problem is, how, what would be uh, the the basis vectors in here vi that would maximize this expression? Keep in mind that x is really our random variable, is our data. So the parameters in here we have are really k and the basis vector. So now let's really look in more uh, depth to what this expression is all about. So maximizing this expression. That's the same one from this here. I could write x transpose vi square as x transpose vi transpose times x transpose vi. And then the x transpose uh, vi transpose becomes vi transpose x transpose transpose, which gives us an x. And then I have the x transpose vi as it is from this second term. But the expected value operator, the basis vectors, these are deterministic. So the expected value operator will operate on X. So now this expression becomes the maximization of the sum over I between one and K of the VI transpose times the autocorrelation matrix uh, for x, which we denote as Rxx, if it has a mean value of zero, then it becomes the covariance matrix times the basis vector vi. So we'll call this expression as j of v, but we'd like to really remind ourselves that we still have this constraints that we have an ortho, a set of orthonormal vectors or uh, basis vectors vi transpose times vj equal to one if i is equal to j so now 
maximizing this expression. So we started with, as a reminder, we try to minimize this expression. We move that to become a maximization of this expression with some plug in, in an expression for our X transpose VI. We are now maximizing this expression here that involves dot correlation of X. So this in here, we know what basis vectors VI would maximize this expression in here, right? And those will be the eigenvectors, right, of Rxx that correspond to the largest K eigenvalues of this autocorrelation matrix or covariance matrix in this specific case. So just for simplification, uh, let's just say k is equal to a 1. And then let's redefine the Lagrangian multiplier to find the optimal value. So the Lagrangian in here, the Lagrange multiplier, I'll call it L of V1. I'll just keep it as I because we can use that for generalization later on. But we can just make it uh, L of V1 because k is equal to 1. But um, for the sake of generalizability, we call it uh, the uh, Lagrange multiplier of, of uh, operator of VI. So equal to our expression, which is J of VI, which is, we define this one here, right? So that will be VI transpose R uh, XX VI minus our lambda, our Lagrangian multiplier, times the constraint. And the constraint is what? Is that VI transpose VI will be equal to a one. This should be a J, right? So that's be our uh, our constraint in here. And now uh, we need to take a derivative of this expression with respect to VI, which is what we have here, and then equate that to a zero. If we do that, since we already have VI is really nothing but a, a V1, uh, if you if you like, then what we will have is this expression here which we know very well from the algebra, right? So we have the autocorrelation matrix R sub XX times a vector VI is equal to a scalar or multiplier lambda times the vector VI in this case. So in this case, this lambda is nothing but the eigen, is an eigenvalue of, uh, of uh, RXX and the corresponding vi is nothing but really the corresponding eigenvector to this lambda and that's basically um, what we have so what we showed so far is that if you are really interested in minimizing uh, if you have this error we're interested in minimizing uh, this error that we have in here we modify this to be maximizing this expression and maximizing this expression here will be maximizing this expression that has to do with the correlation of the x. It ended up that the basis vector that we are really interested in will be the eigenvectors. So the basis vectors are the eigenvectors of the autocorrelation matrix of x. So uh, we can uh, look a little bit. Uh, so to formulate this a little bit. So Rxx uh, is an M by M symmetric non-negative uh, definite uh, matrix. It's a normal matrix. So we can rewrite Rxx times the transpose of Rxx is equal to the transpose of Rxx times the Rxx. And um, this is a unitary, um, basically um, uh, capital P times the transpose of capital P um, equal to the transpose capital phi um, times the phi, which is equal to identity matrix. And the columns in this eigenmatrix, so remember each column in this eigenmatrix is nothing but an eigenvector of the Rxx, right? Just keep in mind, we are just trying to write this in a form that generalizes from this one here, right? So what we have in here is only one vector, right? So we can really generalize this 
and I start to have this matrix that alpha uh, phi in here, where the first column is V1, second column V2, and so on. And for every single one of those, we have the corresponding eigenvalues. So this capital lambda matrix has, is, is a diagonal matrix where we reorder the eigenvalues to start with the largest eigenvalue, which is lambda one in this case, and then second to the largest is lambda two, and so on to the smallest eigenvalue, which is lambda m. So we have m eigenvalues, and then we rearrange our eigen matrix, our capital phi, so that v1 correspond to the largest eigenvalue, lambda one, v2 correspond to the second largest uh, eigenvalue, lambda two, and so on. So now we have this uh, eigen matrix uh, that, in, that has all these uh, m eigenvectors or m basis functions. So now uh, we can start to look into how we can after we derived an optimal, in the mean square sense, an optimal uh, representation or optimal basis vectors of an uh, input uh, signal x or a vector x, how can we uh, do that for our images? So what we found out is that the optimal basis vectors in this case are really the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix Rx. So now, uh, first thing, if we are given an image, F, that can be an M by N, or it can be a square. What we will do for this part is to say, I will really look at this image in terms of columns. And every column in the image is the small x that I had in uh, our derivation of the uh, optimal basis vectors in this case. And that's basically what we have in here. So now that means every column in our image, in a way, is nothing but a realization of a random variable with a zero mean. So we still we have um, assumption that we can really uh, zero mean uh, every single uh, column or the images. And then we can compute the covariance matrix for this uh, f, uh, the, the given image. And then if we, once we have the, uh, the covariance matrix, then we can find the eigenvalues and the corresponding eigenvectors, all m of them, these are the eigenvectors, uh, for our covariance matrix RFF. And then we sort these eigenvectors in a descending order based on the corresponding eigenvalues. And in this case, we can write uh, this transformation of uh, our signal f using this basis functions uh, as we have in here. Or in short, we can write it this way. So now what we have is the KLT transform. So what is the KLT transform? It has the optimal basis vectors, and those are obtained um, from the covariance matrix that is defined by the input image, right? By the input image F in this case. So in reconstruction, we can reconstruct an image or an approximation of the image F. In this case, we can extract the entire image by really plugging back uh, the expression for G, which is the eigen matrix transpose times F. If I do that, I know that the eigen matrix phi times the transpose of phi give me the identity matrix. I get F completely back. So I can really get F back. If I'm using all my eigenvectors in this uh, in this um, representation. So now, what if I don't? 
So what kind of an approximation I'm doing if I don't really uh, do that? So let us really have some assumption here. Um, let's assume that our P, if I take P which has M columns, right, has the M eigenvectors, but let's really take the first K columns of P, and I will call that as capital P tilde. So now capital P tilde, it has the first K columns from the capital P, uh, from the from the eigenmatrix uh, capital P. And now I, if I take the P tilde transpose times F, then I have G uh, tilde, I can get F uh, as an approximation, F tilde approximation of F using this expression here. So now what we would like to do is to see what is really the mean squared error in this case. So the expected value of the difference between our F and our F tilde. And uh, in here we are looking at the Frobenius norm. And this is nothing but the Euclidean norm uh, for matrices. And I have a link in here for those who like to kind of refresh your memory about uh, what is uh, this. This is nothing but the including distance, the including norm of a matrix. So another way to calculate uh, the Frobenius norm is to look at the trace of our matrix. So I can replace uh, that with a trace expected value of F minus F tilde times F minus F tilde transpose. And I have some operations in here. It's straightforward the algebra operations. And then what I'm really most interested in is the final results. So the mean square error in here is the sum of the eigenvalues that I haven't used in constructing my basis of, um, uh, vectors in here, which are the eigenmatrix tilde or the capital phi tilde. So now, the, if, if k is large, very close to m, then basically the mean square error is smaller, right? Or in the other word, I keep fx k, but now if the small values for lambda are really small, so the mean square error is less. You can think of either way or both ways. So from here, we have kind of a, a closed form approximation of what the error is when I represent uh, my image using a subset of the columns in our eigenmatrix matrix. Okay. So here are some examples. Um, so we took this Belgium image. It's already in the image um, library that you have on Canvas. Is a 512 by 512 image. And if I take only the first eight eigenvectors as my basis vectors, so in a way, I'm only taking one over the 64 of our eigenvalues, then here is the image that we reconstructed. If I take the first 80, 80 of those eigenvectors, then as if I'm taking 10 out of the 64 um, uh, vectors. And here is basically the quality of the reconstructed image. If I take half, which is basically correspond to K equal to this, because remember we have 512 capital M in this case, it's 512. So we have 512 eigenvectors in our eigenmatrix. In here, I'm taking the first 256 to correspond to the largest uh, 256 eigenvalues. And here is basically how the image looks like. So you can see there is quite a bit of uh, improvement in the quality um, as we move from uh, only 8 to 80 to 256. And we can really have kind of a pseudocode what we have uh, done so far. 
if we have an image if, then in this pseudocode, I look at every column in the entire image if, every column in here uh, as a, a realization of a random variable. So I take every column, that's why I call it, basically I decompose f into column one, column two, and so on. And then the length of every column is m. I have capital N of these columns. And then I compute the mean of every one of these um, uh, columns. And I subtract the mean from these columns. Um, so this is uh, U1, U2, and U capital N. And the mean in here for every I, uh, it's, so this is for F1I, and there are M of these, right? So this is U1. So I have subtract the mean uh, from each of the columns, so the mean from every one of the columns in the input image, and that will give me the covariance matrix um, that's RFF in this case. And then we compute the eigen the eigen decomposition of this covariance matrix, which are in the eigen matrix in here and the eigen values. And the skeletal lambda is diagonal, but the important thing is we reorder so that start from the largest eigenvalue and then in a descending order of these eigenvalues. And then we pick the first k columns in our eigenmatrix and we represent our image f as f tilde using the first um, k Eigen vectors that correspond to the largest k eigenvalues um, of the covariance matrix. And then we can calculate f tilde using this formula in here, and then we add the mean back at the end. So, um, so far, here is basically what the calculations are. So, the two comments uh, one is so KLT, in terms of energy compaction, is the optimal one in the mean square error sense. However, a very big drawback is that to calculate the KLT for an image, you need to calculate the covariance matrix for that particular image, right? So now, which means that the basis functions, the basis vectors, that you are using in this transform, they rely and they depend on the input the image. That means for every image you get, you have to calculate the basis vectors from scratch, and then you have an optimal compaction transform for that image. You can go around that to find um, a set of images from the same class and then find, but, but the, the bottom line is, the the basis vectors in here depend on the data, depend on the input. This is very different from the cases when we had discrete Fourier transform, DFT, and discrete cosine transform, where in the first, it was the complex exponents. And if you remember the matrix we had before, it was capital U, it has only, it depends only on, um, on these complex exponents, it does not depend on the input image f. And the same thing in the cosine transform, the basis functions are fixed. They don't depend on the input data. This is a very big uh, 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 issue with the KLT. So imagine if you have, you wanna calculate these for real time images or videos coming into, then you have to really make a, um, Calculation of the covariance matrix, which uh, for large images that can be a very large matrix, do the decomposition, find the, find the eigenvalues and the eigen uh, vectors, and then do all that transformation. Uh, so that's a lot of computation 
there. So now um, the question is, can we improve that? Can we can we do a better job than looking at every single column in the image as uh, a realization of random variable? What else can we do? So this is kind of more of a vectorization of the calculation of the KLT. What we will do, we'll divide the image into blocks, as you can see in here, and then we vectorize every single block. So we take this block, for example, the zoom in, and then we trace it row by row, and we make a long, basically, uh, uh, column vector of of this, of the pixels in this this block. So we are vectorizing every single, and then um, questions you may ask: How do you vectorization? Do you do zigzag? Do you do row by row or column by column? That, as far as you are really consistent to what you are doing. It doesn't really matter, but usually you just take the first row. Um, it becomes this is the first row, second row, third row, fourth row, and so on. And now after that, you put all these blocks one after the other. So this is the first block, second block, third block, and so on. And now you have this is your uh, input image F, and every this one is F1, this is F2, and so on. So I have many of them basically in this in this uh, in this case in here. So now, if you do that, then you are what you are really doing is you are uh, concatenating all these vectors into a matrix, and then now this matrix becomes your input f uh, for the pseudo algorithm that we had before. So if you do that then what you will have is something like this. If I have block size of eight by eight, and then I take uh, every eight by eight at 64 pixels, and I, I create a column vector uh, of length 64 for the first block, and the next one and so on. So now I have um, the length of our uh, column vectors are 64. So now our uh, uh, covariance matrix is 64 by 64. So uh, it's more manageable than uh, if you have it as 1024 by 1024 uh, or 512 by 512 uh, images. So this is in here the block size 8 by 8. I take the first column vector, uh, sorry, the first eigen vector, which is column vector actually. And then here is the reconstructed image. This is just by taking the eigenvector, just a single basis function that correspond to the largest eigenvalue. Here is what I get back. If I look at the first 10 out of the 64, or 5 of 32, I get this quality in here. If I take half of them, I get this quality in here. Um, and here's the pseudo code for that operation that we just did in here. Um, the, the only Difference in here, we really just do vectorization here, but everything else after that, by subtracting the mean, calculating the covariance matrix, picking the first uh, k, adding the mean values later, is the same as what we had uh, before. Some examples, I just want to show you this example in here. Uh, we have an, an image one and an image two. And you can see these two images, perceptually they are very different from each other. And if you calculate the KLT bases for the first image, you will get, basically you take the eigenvectors and you plot them i show them as an image as we did before for the cosine the dct and the free transform dft then this will be the klt basis for the image one and this will be the klt basis for the image two and you can see in here the basis functions are different from each other uh, we can easily say just by looking at even the first four just as an example 
um, you can see they are really different from each other, completely different from each other. You can go ahead and look at this one, this one, and so on. So you can see the basis function change based on the input data or the image that we are dealing with. That was not the case when we look at the DCT bases, right? They are fixed, doesn't matter what the input is. And you will find me posting um, a couple of demo of um, files. Uh, there are some in Python, and uh, actually they are both in Python and in MATLAB. Uh, you can obtain this for KLT demo one. You can have different images and see basically how the base functions change. And the second uh, file, either MATLAB or Python, you, both of them are all available on, on Canvas, is really to do the reconstruction. So and what, what this uh, is doing is we start from uh, the first coefficients, either in DCT or in KLT, and we keep adding more and more, and we look at the energy, basically how much of the energy in the original image is being restored. And you can see basically these two curves. Um, so you have the red one is for the KLT and the blue one for the DCT. So the, the two things happening in here, of course, as you really within only 10 coefficients, right? Within 10 coefficients out of the 64 um, coefficients, you are already above 99% of the energy in the image within 10 coefficients. Um, so that shows you basically in the scale T, it's how much compaction is really happening uh, in here. The second thing is, and if you remember, I told you before that DCT um, is, uh, I showed you before a comparison between uh, DCT, the rate distortion care for DCT and um, uh, DFT and uh, the wavelet HAR and uh, Hadamard. And I told you DCT at, at the time is really the best, uh, is better than the others in the rate distortion. And you can see from here uh, that DCT is very, very close to the optimal uh, compaction which transforms is KLT. There are slight differences in here, but it's very small, right? But really, it's very, very close to this one. The DFT and the other ones would be a little bit further as we showed before. Um, so this is basically the reason um, that uh, we use DCT uh, quite a bit and when we talk about compaction, uh, uh, compression, uh, and coding of our images. So uh, I wanna show you some uh, of this demo that I showed you uh, here. So these are all posted, uh, usually the MATLAB one, but the Python one also are available online on Canvas. So you go to, this is the demo one for KLT. is happening here. So this we can just input any image uh, that you have. You can, calculate the KL, you can really view the KLT bases, and then you have DCT bases. Uh, and this actually you can really learn how to vi visualize um, the KLT bases in here. And uh, the second one um, is uh, the second demo. Yeah, this one here. So you can see in here, it's showing you um, at the same time, the reconstructed DCT and the constant KLT. And very quickly, within a few coefficients, 
the quality is reasonable. Um, and as you really add more and more than that kind of 1% left in the energy and the quality uh, is being added. Um, so I, I really advise you to, to utilize these two demos for different images that you have um, and just play with them and see what you get. Uh, equivalently, we have, um, I also posted online the HAR um, demo. Uh, let's see if this works. So this one here, um, it shows you for a certain image um, as you are really reconstructing different levels uh, in the hard transform, uh, how the reconstructed image looks like. Um, so this is something I missed to show you last time, but it really gives you a very interesting, basically, uh, tool uh, to, to understand how the hard reconstruction and the KLT reconstruction and the DCT reconstruction will operate. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's about it for KLT. Bye-bye.